Hello and welcome to Earth Science, Lecture 21, Air Pressure and Wind. Of the various elements of weather and climate, changes in air pressure are the least noticeable. When listening to a weather report, we are generally interested in moisture conditions such as humidity and precipitation, temperature, and perhaps the wind. Rarely do people wonder about air pressure. Although people do not generally notice the hour-to-hour -hour and day-to-day -day variations in air pressure, such changes are very important factors in producing changes in our weather. Variations in air pressure from place to place cause the movement of air that we call wind, and are a significant factor in weather forecasting. As we will see, air pressure is closely tied to another element of weather in a cause-and-effect relationship. Air pressure is simply the pressure exerted by the weight of air above. Average air pressure at sea level is about 1 kilogram per square centimeter, or 14.7 pounds per square inch, which is also called 1 atmosphere, or ATM. Specifically, a column of air 1 inch in cross-section measured from sea level to the top of the atmosphere would weigh about 14.7 pounds. This is roughly the same pressure that is produced by one square inch uh, column of water that is 33 feet in height. With some simple arithmetic, you can calculate the air pressure exerted on the top of a small, say 20 by 40 inch school desk, uh, that it exceeds 11,000 pounds, or the weight of about 50, uh, a 50 passenger uh, bus. So why doesn't the desk happen to collapse under the weight of this ocean of air above it? Simply put, air pressure is exerted in all directions, not just down, it's down, up, and sideways. Thus, the air pressure pushing down on the desk exactly balances the air pressure pushing back up on the desk. Imagine a tall aquarium that has the same dimensions as the small desk mentioned in this last statement. When this aquarium is filled to a height of 33 feet, the water pressure at the bottom equals 1 atmosphere, or that 14.7 pounds per square inch. Now imagine what will happen if the aquarium is placed on top of our student desk, so that all the force is directed downward. Compare this uh, to what results when the desk is placed inside the aquarium and allowed to sink to the bottom. In the latter example, the desk survives because the water pressure is exerted in all directions, not just downward, as in our earlier example. The desk, like your body, is built to withstand the pressure of one atmosphere. It is important to note that although we do not generally notice the pressure exerted by the ocean of air around us, except when ascending or descending in an airplane or tall elevator, it is nonetheless substantial. The pressurized suits that astronauts use on spacewalks are designed to duplicate the atmospheric pressure experienced at Earth's surface. Without these protective suits to keep body fluids from boiling away, astronauts would perish within minutes. The concept of air pressure can also be understood if we examine the behavior of gas molecules. Gas molecules, unlike molecules in that of a liquid or a solid, are not bound to one another, but freely move throughout the space available to them. When two gas molecules collide, what happens, which happens frequently under normal conditions, they bounce off each other as elastic balls. If a gas is confined to a container, this motion is restricted by its sides, much as the walls of a handball court direct the motion of the handball. The continuous bombardment of gas molecules against the sides of the container exerts an outward pressure that we can call air pressure. Although the atmosphere is without walls, it is confined by the Earth's surface and is confined effectively above by the force of gravity that prevents the escape of the molecules. Here we can define air pressure as the force exerted against a surface by the continuous collision of gas molecules. When meteorologists measure air pressure, it is expo expressed in units of millibars. Standard sea level pressure is 1,013.2 millibars. Although the millibar has been the unit of measure on all U.S. weather maps since January of 1940, the media also uses inches of mercury to describe atmospheric pressure, 
In the United States, the National Weather Service converts millibar values to inches of mercury for public aviation use. So let's look at the mercury barometer first. That's what you see on the right. The weight of the column of mercury is balanced by the pressure on the dish uh, by the air above. Inches of mercury is fairly easy to understand. The use of mercury for measuring air pressure dates from 1643, when uh, Torricelli, a student of the famous Italian scientist Galileo, invented the mercury barometer. Torricelli correctly described the atmosphere as a vast ocean of air that exerts pressure on all objects around us. To measure this force, he filled a glass tube, which was closed at one end, with mercury. He then inverted the tube into a dish of mercury. Torricelli found that the mercury flowed out of the tube until the weight of the column was balanced by the pressure that the atmosphere was exerting on the surface of mercury in the dish. When air pressure increases, the mercury in the tube rises. Conversely, when air pressure decreases, so does the height of the column. We also have aneroid barometers. So we wanted to make a smaller device that's more simple. Well, this is a device where we have a black pointer, which shows the current pressure. And when red, the observer would move the gold or other pointer to coincide with this current air pressure. So in other words, you would take this gold pointer and move it directly over the black one. The black one is free to move, the gold one stays wherever you leave it. And so later, you are able to see whether the pressure has fallen, risen, or remained steady. An aneroid barometer uses a partially evacuated metal chamber. The chamber is extremely sensitive to variations in air pressure and thus changes shape, compressing as the air pressure increases and expanding as the pressure decreases. A series of levers transmits the movement of the chamber to the pointers on the dial. The face of an aneroid barometer intended for home, intended for home use is inscribed with the words such as fair, change, rain, and stormy. Notice that fair corresponds with higher pressure readings, whereas rain is associated with low pressure readings. Barometric readings, however, may not always indicate the weather. Falling pressure is often associated with increasing cloudiness and the possibility of precipitation, and vice versa. We'll learn more about this very soon. Simply stated, wind is the result of horizontal differences in air pressure. Air flows from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. You may have experienced this when opening something that is vacuum packed. The noise that you hear is caused by the air rushing from the higher pressure outside the can or jar to the lower pressure inside. Wind is a nature's attempt to balance such inequalities in air pressure. Because unequal heating of Earth's surface generates these pressure differences, solar radiation is the ultimate energy source for most wind. If Earth did not rotate, and if there was no friction between moving air and Earth's surface, air would simply flow in a straight line from areas of high to low pressure. But because Earth does not or because Earth does rotate and friction does exist, wind is controlled by a combination of three factors the pressure gradient force, the Coriolis effect, and friction, all of which we will take a look at in the coming slides. So let's look at the original cause. The force that generates wind results from horizontal pressure differences. When air is subjected to great pressure on one side uh, than it is compared to another side, the imbalance produces a force directed from the region of high to low pressure. Thus, Pressure differences cause wind to blow, and the greater these differences, the greater the wind speed. Variations in air pressure over Earth's surface are determined from barometric readings taken at thousands of weather stations. These pressure measurements are shown on surface weather maps using what we call isobars, where iso means equal and bar is a measure of pressure, or lines that connect places of equal air pressure. The spacing of isobars indicates the amount of pressure change occurring over a given distance, which is called the pressure gradient force. 
So that's what you see in this image here. So the bigger the spacing, the weaker the pressure, the closer they are together, the stronger the pressure. Pressure gradient is analogous to gravity acting on a ball rolling down a hill. A steeper pressure gradient, like a steep hill, causes greater acceleration of a parcel of air than it does a weak uh, pressure gradient or a gentle hill. Thus, the relationship between wind speed and the pressure gradient is straightforward. In general, closely spaced isobars indicate a steep pressure gradient and strong winds, whereas widely spaced isobars indicate a weak pressure gradient and light winds. This figure demonstrates the relationship well. In order to draw isobars on a weather map to show air pressure patterns, meteorologists must compensate for the elevation of each station. Otherwise, high elevation locations, such as Denver, Colorado, would always be mapped as having a high, uh, excuse me, a low pressure. This compensation is accomplished by converting all pressure measurements to sea level equivalents. So this figure that you see is a surface weather map that shows isobars representing the corrected sea level air pressures and wind. Wind direction is shown as wind arrow shafts, so all of those lines that you see are the directions, and the speed is shown by how many little bars or flags they have, and there's a legend on the right. Note that wind flows into a station, so the direction, for example, of this middle wind barb here is toward the station, so kind of southeast, so that's the direction the wind is blowing. The wind flags indicate the expected airflow surrounding pressure cells and are plotted as flying with the wind, that is, toward the station circles. Notice on the map that the isobars are more closely spaced, and therefore the wind speed is faster around those uh, areas. So right here you can see the isobars are pretty darn close together, and so we see really high winds. This is a, a, a dark triangle with one line, which shows uh, wind speeds between 60 and 66 miles per hour. Whereas somewhere down here, where the wind, or where you can see that the lines are far apart, which means there's not a big pressure difference, it's actually showing that there's calm winds. So the closer together these lines are, the more windy it is in general. So in summary, the horizontal pressure gradient is the driving force of wind. The magnitude of the pressure gradient force is shown by the spacing of isobars. The direction of the force is always from high pressure to low pressure. So at this point, please pause the video and take a look at the isobars video linked in the YouTube description or at the following link. So let's take a look at the second effect. So here we have an image that shows the typical air movements associated with high and low pressure systems. Uh, oh, that was the previous image on the previous slide, excuse me. As expected, the air moves out of the regions of high pressure. Let me just go back to this. So you can see that air is moving away from the high pressure. So look at the wind barbs, they're moving toward the station. So wind is flowing away from the H, away from the high pressure, and into the low pressure. You can see that they're directed toward the L. So the air moves out of the regions of high pressure and into the regions of low pressure. However, the wind does not cross the isobars at right angles, as the pressure gradient force directs it to. The direction deviates as a result of Earth's rotation. This has been named the Coriolis effect, after the French scientist who first thoroughly described it. All free-moving objects or fluids, including the wind, are deflected to the right of their path in the northern hemisphere and to the left of their intended path in the southern hemisphere. The reason for this deflection can be illustrated by imagining the path of a rocket launched from the North Pole toward a target location on the equator. If the rocket took an hour to reach its target, during its flight, Earth would have rotated 15 degrees to the east. To someone standing on Earth, it would look as if the rocket had veered off its path and hit Earth 15 degrees west of its intended target. The true path of the rocket is straight and would appear so to someone that, uh, looking out in space, would see it deflected. So. The goal is to go from the North Pole to a target on the equator, but because of Earth's rotation, you are actually moving to the right because it's rotating off to the left. 
So just imagine following this line path while the Earth underneath you is rotating to the left. So your apparent motion is rightward. The reason for this deflection can be illustrated this way. The same deflection is experienced by wind, regardless of the direction it is moving. So we attribute the apparent shift in wind direction to the Coriolis effect. This deflection, one, is always directed at right angles to the direction of airflow, two, affects only wind direction and not wind speed, three, is affected by wind speed, so uh, the stronger the wind, for example, the greater the deflection, and four, it is strongest at the poles and weakens as you move toward the equator. Uh, this has to do with the fact that um, a solid rotating object spins faster near the poles than it does at the equator, but we'll get to all this later. Note that any free-moving object will experience a deflection caused by the Coriolis effect. For example, the U.S. Navy dramatically discovered this fact in World War II. During target practice, long-range guns on battleships continually missed their targets by as much as several hundred yards until ballistic corrections were made for the changing position of a seemingly stationary target. Over a short distance, however, the Coriolis effect is, of course, small. The effect of friction on wind is important only within a few kilometers of Earth's surface. Friction acts to slow air movement and, as a consequence, will alter the direction of the wind. To illustrate friction's effect on wind direction, let us take a look at a situation in which friction has no effect. Above the layer of friction, the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis effect work together to direct the flow of air. Under these conditions, the pressure gradient force causes air to start moving across the isobars. All right, so here we are. This is an imaginary surface of air way above the surface. And here's our starting point. So we have high pressure toward the front of this and low pressure in the back. So naturally, the wind will flow from high to low pressure. Uh, let's see. But as soon as the air starts to move, the Coriolis effect acts at right angles to this motion. The faster the wind speed, the greater the deflection. So we are moving from high to low pressure, but then the Coriolis effect kicks in, and it starts to pull this wind to the right, which you see with these little black arrows. It's always pointing to the right. So what happens is the wind is starting to curve. And so instead of just moving from high to low pressure, it's slightly altered to the right, and it will keep bending to the right. Eventually, the Coriolis effect will balance this pressure gradient force, and the wind will blow parallel to the isobars. Upper air winds generally take this path, and are called geostrophic winds. The lack of friction with Earth's surface allows geostrophic winds to travel at much higher speeds than they do at the surface. So many of them can be moving at 50 to even 100 miles per hour up at this height. This simplified weather chart shows the direction and speed of the upper air winds. Note from the flags that the airflow is almost parallel to the contours. In other words, they're all parallel to the isobars. The most prominent feature of upper level flow are jet streams. These are fast moving rivers of air that travel 75 to 150 miles per hour in an east, or excuse me, in a west to east direction on average. This chart shows the direction and speed of the upper air winds. And again, note that they are parallel to the contours. So here is a ridge where we have high pressure, a trough with low pressure, and you can see that the upper air winds are traveling with the isobars, and they're generally pretty fast. But now, let's take a look at what's happening at the surface. So these are all examples without friction. Now let's encounter what happens with friction. Below about 600 meters, or 2,000 feet, friction complicates the airflow just as described. Recall that the Coriolis effect is proportional to wind speed. So friction uh, lowers wind speed, though. So friction will also aid in reducing the Coriolis effect. Because the pressure gradient force is not affected by wind speed, it wins the tug of war. So the result is that a movement of air at an angle across the isobars will generally point slightly to the right toward the area of lower pressure. So here's the upper air winds as we described. Wind will blow with the isobars 
but friction acts to weaken this Coriolis effect. So it turns out the pressure gradient force is going to win out over the weakened Coriolis effect, and so instead of pointing with the isobars, it points slightly more toward the low pressure. So that's what we mean when we say it's winning the tug of war between the two. So in summary, upper airflow is nearly parallel to isobars, whereas the effect of friction causes the wind surface or surface winds to move more slowly and cross the isobars at some angle. So at this point, please pause the video and watch the video on friction in the following link or at the YouTube description. So this discussion can lead us into the topic of highs and lows. We've already mentioned them in this video, so let's discuss them in some more detail. Among the most common features on a weather map are the areas designated as pressure centers. Cyclones, or lows, are centers of low pressure, and anticyclones, or highs, are areas of high pressure. The pressure decreases from the outer isobars toward the center in a cyclone. In an anticyclone, just the opposite is the case. The values of the isobars increase from the outside toward its center. Knowing just a few basic facts about the centers of high and low pressure greatly increases your understanding of current and forthcoming weather. Note that wind blows inward and counterclockwise around a low, as you can see on the right. And wind blows outward and clockwise around a high like you can see on the left. Air spirals inward at a surface low pressure system. The net inward transport of air causes a shrinking of the area occupied by that air mass, a process that is termed horizontal convergence. So you can see air is converging on this low pressure system. Whenever air converges horizontally, it has to pile up, it has nowhere else to go. That is, it increases in height to allow for the decreased area to now uh, to allow for the decreased area that it now occupies. For a surface low to exist for very long, compensation must occur at some layer aloft. For example, surface convergence could be maintained if divergence or spreading out occurs aloft at a rate equal to the inflow. The rate of this vertical movement is slow generally less than 0.6 miles per day. Nevertheless, because rising air often results in cloud formation and precipitation, a low pressure center is generally related to unstable conditions and stormy weather. Because descending air is compressed and warmed, cloud formation and precipitation is unlikely in an anticyclone or high pressure system. Thus fair weather can usually be expected with the approach of a high pressure center. You should now be better able to understand why television weather reports emphasize the position and projected paths of cyclones and anticyclones. The villain on these weather programs is always the low pressure center, which produces the worst weather in many seasons. Lows move in a roughly west to east path across the United States due to the prevailing upper air winds and require generally a few days to more than a week for the journey to complete. Because their paths can be somewhat erratic, accurate predictions of their migration is difficult, although it is essential for any for, uh, forthcoming uh, forecasts. Meteorologists must also determine whether the flow aloft will intensify an embryo storm or act to suppress its development. Because of the close tie uh, between conditions at the surface and those aloft, a great deal of emphasis has been placed on the importance of understanding total atmospheric circulation, particularly at the mid-latitudes where the United States is. So now we must examine the workings of Earth's general atmospheric circulation, and then again consider the structure of these in light of this knowledge. So now we're going to look at a global scale. The underlying cause of wind, again, is the unequal heating of Earth's surface. Well, in tropical regions, more solar radiation is received than is radiated back to space. In polar re regions, the opposite is true. Less solar energy is received than is lost. So the atmosphere acts as a giant heat transfer system, moving warm air towards the poles and cool air towards the equator in an attempt to balance these forces. 
On a smaller scale, but for the same reason, ocean currents also contribute to global heat transfer. The general circulation is complex, and a great deal has yet to be explained. We can, however, develop a general understanding by first considering the circulation that would occur on a non-rotating Earth, having a uniform surface. So just imagine a perfectly smooth sphere, and imagine that it did not rotate. So we're going to modify this system a bit to make some observe observations. So on a hypothetical non-rotating planet with a smooth surface of either all land or all water, two large thermally produced cells of air will form. The heated equatorial air will rise until it reaches the tropopause, in other words the top of the troposphere, which acts like a lid and then deflects the air towards the poles. Eventually, this upper level airflow will reach the poles where it cools and sinks, which spreads it out in all directions at the surface and moves it back toward the equator. Once there, it would be reheated and start the journey over again. This hypothetical circulation system has upper level airflow moving poleward and surface air moving equatorial. So at the surface, air moves from cold to hot where it heats up, rises, and then moves from hot to cold toward the poles and this just continues. So without rotation, this is what our airs would always look like. So winds at the surface where we live would always blow from north to south, for example. But of course, that is not realistic. We have a rotating Earth. So what does that do to those cells of air? Well, if we add in the effects of rotation, this simple convective system breaks down into smaller cells. This figure here illustrates the three pairs of cells proposed to carry on the task of heat redistribution on our rotating planet. The polar and tropical cells retain the characteristics of the thermally generated convection described earlier, so we do see the warmth rise toward the equator and cooler air sink at the poles, but it becomes more complicated. So here we see near the equator, the rising warm and moist air is associated with the pressure zone that we call an equatorial low. So it's a low pressure system where air is rising. So as a result, we do tend to see a lot of precipitation near the equator, which is why they're the tropics. So air rises at this equatorial low. And because this is a zone where winds from the north and south converge, you can see that right here where the red arrows are moving toward one another, it is often referred to also as the intratropical convergence zone, or ITCZ. So note that the equatorial low and the ITCZ is the same, in case you ever see that on a map. As the diverging upper level uh, flow from uh, the region of low pressure in a zone, where am I, excuse me, uh, as the diverging upper level flow from the equatorial low reaches 20 to 30 degrees latitude north or south, so you can see that here, 30 degrees north or south, uh, it sinks back down toward the surface. This subsidence and associated adiabatic heating produces hot arid conditions. So it's more like a, a permanent high pressure in this region now. So it's more dry because you typically get uh, less air rising instead it's sinking. So in this case we see less cloud cover and more arid or desert-like conditions. The center of this subsiding dry air is the subtropical high. So you can see that labeled right in the middle close to 30 degrees. This encircles the globe at 30 degrees latitude north and south. The great deserts of Australia, Arabia, and Africa exist because of the stable dry conditions produced by this subtropical high. So note that this crosses over the Sahara Desert. Note that the remainder uh, travels poleward. So in this case we have trade winds that move uh, down from the subtropical high and toward the equator, but some of it moves up and toward the poles. So air is being pushed down at this subtropical high, so it has to spread out at the surface. We get the westerlies that are deflected, of course, from west to east, and the trade winds that are near the equator. The interaction of these warm and cool winds produces a stormy belt known as a polar front. So this is close to where the polar easterlies are up at the top. So we see that cold air sinks near the poles, and as a result, air spreads out, and this gives us our polar easterlies, which means wind is blowing in from the east. 
so it's kind of the opposite of what we're used to down here in the United States. Their winds blow from east to west. So in the middle, you get the polar front, where we have another low pressure region. This is called the subpolar low, and again, you tend to see some stormier activity in this region as a result. So in summary, this simplified global circulation is dominated by four pressure zones. The subtropical and polar highs are areas of dry subsiding air that flows outward at the surface and produces the prevailing winds. The low pressure zones of the equatorial and subpolar regions are associated with inward and upward airflow accompanied by clouds and precipitation. So please pause the video and watch uh, the linked video. Note that you can start it at 3.33 if you want to save some time. Okay, so up to this point, we have described the surface pressure and associated winds as continuous belts around the Earth. However, the only truly continuous pressure belt is the subpolar low in the southern hemisphere, where the ocean is uninterrupted by land masses. So you can see that down here, there is a continuous stretch of water from one, uh, well, basically all around the globe. At other latitudes, particularly in the northern hemisphere, where land masses break up the ocean surface, large seasonal temperature differences disrupt this pattern. So this figure shows the resulting pressure and wind patterns for both January and July. The circulation over the oceans is dominated by semi-permanent cells of high pressure in the subtropics and cells of low pressure over the subpolar regions. So you can see the highs here and the lows up at the top. The subtropical highs are responsible for the trade winds and westerlies, as mentioned earlier. The large land masses, on the other hand, particularly Asia, become cold in the winter and develop a seasonal high pressure system from which surface flow is directed off the land. See that in figure A. Uh, we have a high pressure and winds are being blown off the land. In the summer, the opposite occurs. The land masses are heated and develop a low pressure cell which permits air to flow onto the land. So now you can see that here. Now it's warm, so there's a lot of air rising, and so air tends to flow into the continental mass now instead. These seasonal changes in wind direction are known as monsoons. During warm months, areas such as India experience a flow of warm, water-laden air from the Indian Ocean, which produces the rainy summer monsoons. The winter monsoon is dominated by dry continental air. A similar situation exists, but to a lesser extent, over North America. So typically you see monsoon season in the southwest, more in the Arizona region. In summary, the general circulation is produced by semi-permanent cells of high and low pressure over the oceans, but is complicated by seasonal changes over land. Note that we have examined Earth's large-scale circulation, but let us turn briefly to winds that influence much smaller areas. Remember that all winds are produced for the same reason, pressure differences that arise because of temperature differences caused by unequal heating of Earth's surface. Local winds are small-scale winds produced by locally generated pressure gradients. Those described here are caused either by topographic effects or by variations in surface composition in the immediate area. In coastal areas during the warm summer months, the land is heated more intensely during the daylight hours than the body of water next to it. As a result, the air above land heats and expands and rises, creating an area of lower pressure. A sea breeze then develops, because the cooler air over water moves toward the warm land. So you get a sea breeze. This is why if you're ever near an ocean or something, you get a breeze pretty much continuously coming off of the ocean or body of water, because the warm air is rising over land, it sinks over the cooler water, and thus blows from the high to low pressure. The sea breeze begins to develop shortly before noon and generally reaches its greatest intensity during the mid to late afternoon. These relatively cool winds can be a significant moderating influence on afternoon temperatures in coastal areas. Small-scale sea breezes can also develop along the shores of large lakes. People who live in a city near the Great Lakes, such as Chicago, recognize this lake effect, especially in the summer. And note, just 
As a personal example, I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is right on Lake Michigan, just north of Chicago, and in the summer, it is generally a few degrees cooler along the coast than it is more inland, and the opposite is true in the winter. At night, the reverse process can take place, however. The land cools more rapidly than the sea, and so a land breeze can develop. A daily wind similar to land and sea breezes occurs in many mountainous regions. During daylight hours, the air along the slopes of a mountain is heated more intensely than the air at the same elevation over the valley floor. Because this warmer air is less dense, it glides upward along the slopes and generates a valley breeze. The occurrence of these daytime upslope breezes can be often identified by the cumulus clouds that develop on adjacent mountainous peaks. After sunset, the pattern may reverse. Rapid radiation cooling along the mountain slopes produces a layer of colder air next to the ground. Because cold air is more dense than warm air, it drains or funnels down the slopes of the mountains into the valley. This movement of air is called a mountain breeze. The same type of cool air drainage can occur in places that have modest slopes. The result is that the coldest pockets of air are usually in the lowest spots. Like many other winds, mountain and valley breezes have seasonal tendencies. Although valley breezes are more common during warm season, when solar heating is most intense, mountain breezes tend to be more dominant in the cold season. So note that winds again are always labeled by the direction from which they blow. So. If we say the wind is north, that means it's coming from the north, not that it's blowing toward the north. When the wind consistently blows, more often from one direction than any other, it is called a prevailing wind. The instrument that is commonly used to describe wind, uh, wind direction, is the wind vane, which you see on the bottom of this instrument here. So this guy will spin around with the direction of the wind and point it out. Wind speed is typically measured using a cup anemometer, which you can see at the top here. So this picks up the wind and it moves faster with the stronger wind, and this shows direction. Note that this is just one random example of a device that measures these things. There are many ways for these to be measured. So to close out our long discussion on wind, we can then describe El Nino and La Nina. In fact, right now as we speak, this is um, March of 2019, uh, El Nino is just starting to ramp up right now. So it's a pretty relevant discussion. El Nino is the name given to the periodic warming of the Pacific Ocean in December or January. Uh, note that it's not either of those months, it's just a little bit late right now. But this period of abnormal warming happens at irregular intervals of two to seven years and usually persists for a span of nine months to two years. During an El Nino, strong equatorial countercurrents amass large quantities of warmer than normal water along the western coast of South America. The unusually warm water and associated low pressure cause arid areas of Peru and Chile to receive more uh, unusually heavy rains than that can, I guess, basically lead to major flooding, for example. In addition, the warm surface waters blocks the upwelling of colder, nutrient-filled water, which is the primary food source for millions of small feeder fish. And so this can actually pose a problem. So here's just an image depicting this. So during an El Nino event, the pressure over the eastern Pacific drops. So we get a low pressure, while the pressure over the western Pacific rises, and that gives you more of a high pressure situation. This causes the trade winds to diminish, leading to an eastward movement of warm water along the equator. This strengthens the equatorial countercurrent causing surface waters of the central and eastern Pacific to warm, while those in the west to cool. So we get warmer waters during El Nino over on the eastern Pacific, and we get more storms because it develops a low pressure where air is rising. And then the vice and vice versa situation occurs over Australia and um, regions in the western Pacific where the pressure is increasing, which means, it, which means air is sinking and you see less cloud cover, for example. Well, within one or two years, the circulation associated with El Nino is usually replaced by La Nina. La Nina, which means little girl, is essentially the opposite of El Nino 
which refers to little boy, and refers to colder than normal sea surface temperatures in the eastern Pacific. The atmospheric circulation in the equatorial Pacific during La Nina is dominated by strong trade winds. These wind systems, in turn, generate a strong equatorial current that flows westward from South America toward Australia. This circulation pattern is often associated with flooding in northern Australia and Indonesia, whereas especially dry conditions prevail along the west coast of South America. So in other words, it's basically just the opposite of El Nino. So now we're colder on our side with more uh, high pressure, so less storms, but the opposite is true over here. Now they get lots of low pressure and warmer waters over Australia and Indonesia, as an example. So, with all of this discussed, we can look at our last topic, the distribution of precipitation. In general, regions influenced by high pressure, with its associated subsidence and diverging winds, experience relatively dry conditions. Again, on the other hand, regions under the influence of low pressure and its converging rising winds receive ample precipitation. So temperature of the air, the distribution of land and water, and mountain barriers can all contribute to the distribution of precipitation around the world. In general, high latitudes receive meager precipitation because cold air cannot hold very much moisture. So the humidity is low and results in low precipitation. But the opposite is true near the equator. Here we have lots of uh, warm, moist air that rises, and so we see lots of precipitation as a result. So let us conclude this lecture with a series of questions, as usual. So remember that whenever we look at these, um, you should pause the video on these questions, think of an answer, and then resume the video when you have one. So the first question says, Air pressure at sea level is roughly equal to what? The answer here is 1 kilogram per square centimeter, or 14.7 pounds per square inch. Notice it tried to trick you with 14.7s thrown in there, but it is 1 kilogram oops, excuse me, per square centimeter. Number two, blank spaced isobars indicate a blank pressure gradient and strong winds. Okay, so the answer here is that closely spaced isobars indicate a steep pressure gradient and strong winds. So remember, the closer together those lines are, the stronger the winds are. Question three. What are fast moving rivers of air traveling from west to east? Okay, so remember that our rivers of air up way above the surface are what is known as jet streams. These rapidly travel from west to east. Question four. What are cyclones? Okay, in this case, they're zones of low pressure. Our so low pressure systems are cyclones, and they are the opposite of our anticyclones are high pressure systems. Number five. The topmost red arrows on this image indicate which of the following. So we're looking at these arrows here that go over the United States and Europe. All right, well, think about which way the winds are blowing in this case. They're blowing from the west. So we call these westerlies. These are the prevailing winds at our mid latitudes. So the ones that govern basically the motion of our weather here in the United States. Number six, the equatorial low is also known as what? All right, in this case, it is the intertropical convergence zone. So it's equatorial, so it's in the tropics, and it's a low, so air is converging. So it's the intertropical convergence zone. Last but not least, number seven. The local weather report indicates strong northwest winds for much of the day. You are planning a hike. If you want to take a break from the wind, on which side of a shelter, such as a tree or a boulder, would you use to break from the wind? Okay, so remember, the direction of wind is the direction it's coming from. So this is saying wind is coming from the northwest, so you need to be on the opposite side of that 
to the southeast. Okay, as always, thanks for watching and have a great day.